Hi everyone, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. First things first, if you enjoy our work, Super Chats are available right now. It's a way for you to show your financial support and we very much appreciate it. Also, we are excited to have Dr. Gary Nolan uh, from Stanford University who will be joining us Sunday, March 26th at uh, 12 noon. Uh, it's going to be a really great interview. Um, yeah, I'm just so excited about, excited about it. So for over a year, we have been talking about the efforts by Congress, led by Senators Kirsten Gillibrand, Marco Rubio, and others, to get the Pentagon to come clean about the existence of UFOs, which you know, they like to call UAPs now. Congress wrote 33 pages of legislation. 33 pages regarding UFOs that was signed into law by President Biden. What we've also learned is that the United States Air Force is not cooperating with Congress. Today, leaked images of a UFO of over northern Iraq taken by a United States Air Force Reaper, uh, Reaper spy drone hit the news on the weaponized podcast with Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. The Daily Mail released an article about this bombshell leak this morning. Joining us today is the co-author of this article, Christopher Sharp. Chris, uh, how are you doing? Hey there. Yeah, not doing too bad, thank you. Thanks it's for good. having me on. Great to uh, see you again. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Uh, Chris, uh, we consider, consider you a, a great friend of the show, and we always enjoy uh, listening to your uh, perspectives, and we know our listeners uh, our listeners uh, do as well. Uh, so, yeah, so let's uh, let's get back to it. The most important question, how's the weather in London? It's it's very, very gray, very, very rainy. But look, I lighten things up by going to my son's room where I write a lot of my articles. As you can see from the dinosaur bedding here, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in a very, very small apartment in central London. I, yeah, I, I love that. It's actually here in Los Angeles, it's been gray and rainy for almost like all of... Uh, all of this month, and we're finally like uh, finally out of uh, out of the drought. So, okay, first things uh, first. Actually, second things first, because we just asked you about the weather. Of course, everyone wants to know that. Uh, but uh, uh, there's some big news on your uh, on your work. So, uh, your stuff is uh, your fine stuff is now syndicated uh, on the uh, on the what the uh, uh, the Roswell uh, Daily Record, correct? Yes, yes, it's a hugely proud moment for me. It's the first time that my works in within the Liberation Times has been syndicated in print print format. So what will happen? I mean, I just said to them that you can just take a pick of the articles that you want to um, publish in print form. Uh, so the, the what will happen is I will print them online and. Uh, well, print online. Sorry, um, I will publish online and then they will um, they'll print the print the actual um, articles out in Roswell. So yeah, it is a, it's a really, 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 really cool arrangement. And it's great to see that, yes, yeah, someone, you know, with uh, primary reading epilepsy and has struggled with linguistic activities all his life is getting uh, syndicated. It's great. It's a great honor. It means a lot. Yeah. Wow. I, yeah. I think, uh, I think that's amazing. Real quick, uh, Christian Morales, thank you for the, uh, for the super chat. Um, yeah, man, I, I have to say, I mean, I've, you know, you and I speak in private quite often. And, you know, as I've told you several times, I mean, you're, you're covering this entire topic with the rigor of the Washington Post journalists that broke Watergate. And while a great many of, uh, you know, there are a, a few other uh, fellow journalists that, that are covering it as well, but I think you're doing such a great job. And really the mainstream media is just completely asleep at the wheel. Uh, on what is really, I think, one of the, the biggest topics uh, or biggest uh, bits of news for, uh, you know, really kind of for, uh, for humanity. So, all right, so today you, uh, you co-wrote this article with uh, Josh uh, Boswell on the uh, Daily Mail, exclusive, the truth is out there, skinny cylindrical UFO flying near Baghdad is seen in six new thermal images taken by a U.S. drone uh, last year. And uh, now th this uh, was actually, uh, so these, these images, as I understand, this uh, came out from uh, Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp, uh, these guys uh, right here. They, they have this fantastic podcast uh, called uh, Weaponized. And these guys, 
man, they're like Batman and Robin. Of course, I don't know uh, who would be uh, who would be Batman and who would be Robin. But you know, these guys are like the the dynamic duo of like chasing this this crazy uh, this crazy subject uh, down. So. Uh, uh, so yeah, so if you would walk us, uh, walk the users, uh, sorry, walk the, the viewers uh, through this great piece of, uh, this great article that you broke today on the Daily Mail. Absolutely. So a lot of the credit goes to Jeremy and, and George. I mean, who else out there is getting, <laughs> getting this, this material out, you know, at a time when we're complaining about a lack of transparency um, within the US government, you know, can't exactly rely on them at the moment to release data and materials. So, you know, George and Jeremy, they believe in transparency and they're doing fantastic work. And it's all due to the fact that they're very, very rigorous. What they do, they try to be honest as possible. And mostly of all, like people trust them. I mean, you don't get those kind of sources that they have if you don't have a level of trust. And there's certain things that they do to ensure they're protecting their sources um beyond all else so for for instance um these images were captured from a video but they didn't want to release the, the actual video because that could compromise their sources in some way so um that, that's why they choose to do that so i mean obviously one of the main cult goals there is transparency but, but obviously if you're going to speak out you know and you're going to trust some journalists you're thinking gosh i've got a family i've got a career i'm putting i'm putting that potentially on the line you know so the trust between you know these sources and, and Jeremy and, and, and George it's so important I can't I can't stress that enough uh, so all props to them for, for what they've done here um, so yeah this is this is actually this is imagery from footage uh, last last May so we're talking May 2022 over northeastern Iraq so that's just above Baghdad um in terms of area that we're talking about and the footage is well, the imagery of the footage comes from the u.s air force and the u.s air force has designated this as an identified aerial phenomena wow is the um yes yeah, so, so that was how it was designated um they they did analysis you can imagine that they were aware of the assets over the area in terms of five i five eyes assets and um activity for example from from iran from from isis and you know they, they see this stuff all the time in terms of rockets being fired and drones and stuff like that in the region you can imagine so for them just to do initial analysis and to classify it as an identified aerial phenomena is it's interesting it's it's interesting but i think with this story because you know, the, the biggest story was the fact that it wasn't being shared up the chain from our understanding with um, the, with the wider intelligence community. And it wasn't going to the ARRIW, which was uh, probably at the time AOIMSG. Uh, so right. it wasn't being shared. So you, you can't at the same time be confident that it's been analyzed the rigor that other cases may have been analyzed to. So what Jeremy and George wish to do this footage to say, look, it's been designated unidentified um, aerial phenomena. Um, there's been some initial kind of analysis that's been done as well. Um, and we'd love to crowdsource it just to see if, um, if anyone could potentially work it out. And I think at the moment from looking online, I mean, th there's no definitive answer that there's this, there's certainly theories um going around but um it would definitely be interesting to kind of like see where we're at in a few days time in terms of the analysis and where we're at then um but the, the wider story here is that look whether it's prosaic or or, or or not um we we don't know what these things are uh, and it's very very important because it's not just u.s forces in that area it's you know british forces as well and um and forces from other nations that are there as part of like the, I think it's like a coalition against um, ISIS there that are, they're operating. So it, it's very, very important. And it seems that there are people within the US Air Force, members of the US Air Force, who are also thinking along the same lines. And they're quite frustrated because they see this stuff getting buried. So, you know, whether it's you know, something that may be prosaic, but perhaps still a threat because we don't know what exactly it is, 
um, or if it's something truly astonishing. It's being buried and it, it should go up the chain to, um, to, to be analysed and to work out its origin. And, you know, those channels do exist. Uh, so I think the frustration's there. So I think our hope in terms of this story, the wider aspiration was to make sure that um, the, the intelligence community and the, the arrow are aware that this stuff exists and in the future it can be shared and um, go up the tra chain and you know be analyzed with with some rigor so th that was one of the <laughs> that was one of the goals of um, of this article so it was a wider kind of um, aim there so you've got like a few people who just like focus on the image which is obviously important you know and um, but I think in terms of, of the story that Josh and I put out you know, we wanted to focus on that, but also focus on the wider thing that's happening here, especially as the US Air Force is now under the microscope following the uh, the Balloon Gate incident. Yeah, and in, in, a, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll, show, we'll show some of these images. Uh, and uh, folks, if you have questions, uh, please put them in all caps in the chat, and we'll, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll make some time for uh, some questions uh, uh, for Chris here. Yeah, it's, I, I think, the one thing that you hear constantly, constantly, uh, even from uh, former uh, uh, Secretary of Def Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, is that the United States Air Force is not playing ball. Uh, I've heard this from congressional sources. Uh, it's, it's, they're highly frustrated. So this leads you to the question of why is the United States Air Force specifically not engaging? I mean, and they they are uh, flouting the will of Congress because this this uh, you know part of that legislation that I spoke about in the intro uh, mandates that all of this stuff that is going to Arrow, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, that that is kind of the nexus of all of this information, so that they can process it and send it up the chain as far as you know what all this stuff is. The U.S. Air Force, they are hiding stuff. I guarantee it. Uh, there, there is no other reason why, uh, in my opinion, it's purely my opinion, but no other reason why they would uh, be flouting the will of Congress. And, you know, and as you say, it's like this stuff is flying around uh, in airspace uh, that is, uh, that has, you know, both our, uh, our military men and women in the air and also our allies, our, our allies, our UK allies. And it's, it's I mean, in my opinion, uh, it's, uh, you know, U.S. Air Force dereliction of duty uh, to not be sending this up the ladder to have it, uh, have it properly, uh, properly investigated. So, uh, so with that said here, let's, let's take a quick look at these images and maybe you can kind of, uh, so I, I put up four of them and uh, maybe you can kind of walk us through, you know, what we're looking at uh, so here's uh, here is the very first image, which uh, uh, I believe you see the object coming in on the left. I, it's kind of uh, hidden uh, with, on my monitor here. Do you see uh, anything there, Chris? Yeah. So, so you can. Uh, firstly, I will say, look, I am I am no imagery expert, and this is part of the reason why why we did crowdsource it. Although we did know that some initial analysis had been done. So obviously here you can see something kind of like a cylindrical and, and skinny come into the frame there. And then I think what you can see is you can see like a, what appears to be like a plume um, coming out. But I mean, it's been suggested that look, that's that might be an artifact, artifact, camera artifact, for example. Um, and, uh, and one of the most interesting things is that the object is dark. It appears to be cold um, through the thermal imaging. And I mean, you see some back and forth on Twitter, but you know, one of the interesting points I think someone brought up say that I've never seen a, a missile that's cold before, or or a bird for that instance. <laughs> that's um, right. That's that cold um, in terms of the thermal imaging. But look, um, as, as I see it, not, nothing is conclusive yet, and um, I look forward to just kind of like seeing some more, um, you know, hypothesis put put forward in terms of explaining it. Uh, so yeah, I, I, yeah, it doesn't have any um, flight control surfaces, and we were also told by um, sources that it appeared to be under intelligent control. So that's that's kind of what we've got in terms of the um, 
the information behind this and uh, we called it the, um, I think it was the Baghdad Phantom. Um, that's for a reason, something that I can't disclose though. But uh, look, also I'd add as well that this isn't the end of the story. There's a wider context of it, um, which we may or may, ne- may not get into in the next few weeks or so. So um, yeah, yeah, th- th- look, you know, we, we released the, um, the Orb of Mosul as well. Um, so it, it's clear that there is activity going on in the, the the Middle East that they are picking up stuff which is being designated as UAP. Yeah, the uh, uh, you know uh, it was actually oh, first of all uh, you know credit really goes out to Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp uh, for getting a hold of this stuff. And I, I have to say, I, George Knapp obviously is kind of like the the, the grandfather of uh, of chasing this thing down. You know, he he was the first one to break uh, uh, break the uh, story about Area Fifty One and uh, the whole Bob Lazar story. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, when uh, Jeremy Corbell teamed up with him, and like I said, it's like the dynamic duo. And, and going back to what you were talking about earlier in, in terms of uh, uh, your sources, uh, one of the things that really stuck out in my mind, Jer- Jeremy was like one of the very first people I ever saw uh, in the press uh, uh, talking about this subject. And one of the things I remember him saying is that if you want to be trusted, be trustworthy. And uh, so when when sources come to you and it's off the record or they they can't tell you where something came from, you have to, as a journalist, you you have to respect that because it's, you know, there there are people, their jobs are on the line, their security clearance is on the line, and they can't afford to divulge who they are uh, because of the repercussions that that they would would encounter. Yeah, Corbell noted, uh, there was a quote, uh, actually, no, sorry. Uh, Marco Rubio uh, stated uh, recently the last 72 hours. I'm sorry. This this is uh, what was ha- uh, this was what this was his statement following the whole balloon incident. Uh, the last 72 hours revealed to the public what was happening for years. Unidentified aircraft routinely operating over uh, over U.S. airspace. And again, we go back to this whole question of. Why is the Air Force completely trying to hide all of this? What are they hiding, and why are they hiding it? Um, uh, you know, one, uh, one, and I'm curious uh, your thoughts on this. One, one thing that that uh, bit of news on the UAP front was the the story that uh, someone very high up in the Navy, perhaps an admiral or, or someone of that uh, of that stature. Uh, approached uh, national the national security advisor of the of uh, the Biden administration and said, "Look, this is what the Air Force is doing. This is what they are hiding. Uh, this is illegal, um, and this is what this was uh, the reason that Jake Sullivan, national security advisor of uh, the Biden administration, formed this. I don't know if it's like a select committee or, or, or what what uh, what you call it, but my understanding is that it was a way to." wrestle away the subject from the DOD to a certain uh, certain amount so that so that they could fully trust what information that they were getting and that they were worried that the Pentagon uh, was uh, being untruthful uh, regarding the subject which I believe they are I'm just curious if, if you have any more thoughts on that or if I'm you think am, am I characterizing this correctly yeah yeah so in terms of this um this team. So it's an interagency team, um, reportedly led by um, Jake Sullivan. So I can I can I can tell, I can tell you that. Uh, sorry, my son was just calling me. Uh, that's okay. Um, I can tell you. He's like, Daddy. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> that's all right. No worries. All good. Um, so, so apologies. Um, so, so yeah. So I mean, um, I, I was told back in October that they were looking, advocates, let's say, behind the scenes, were looking to lobby for some kind of office or group under Biden, basically, um, at that kind of level. Um, so that seems to have come to fruition now. <laughs> so, and, and, I, and I think what they were looking to do is that they were looking, because what, one of the problems the whole way through was that 
you need someone in there that can butt heads together, you know, and, and say to the Air Force, I want that information, you release it. And, you know, you're so senior that, the, you know, someone from the Air Force can't say, you know, screw you, I'm not giving you anything. So I think that was one of the the problems that, you know, the UAPTF encountered, for instance, that there wasn't anyone senior enough to perhaps get the um, information from the US Air Force and and other kind of, um, you know, departments and, um, and offices. So I think it's seen that having something kind of like within the, the, the White House is that you have that weight now. You know, you can't turn up and say to, you know, Sullivan or, or Biden, saying, no, I'm not going to give you that information. Right. Because you're talking about the highest authorities now. So sure. it's, it's really, really important. But obviously, we have to wait as well, because the White House hasn't really provided him any information officially about what this, you know, interagency team will be tasked with, what are they going to be their responsibilities, um, and how does it tie in with what the Arrow is doing, for example. So I think all that needs to be decided as well. So, um, but I, I can only talk about the kind of like aspiration um, of those behind the scenes kind of advocating this cause. And in terms of this, um, uh, these claims circulating about this, by the way, this very, very senior person, very, very senior person, um, that reportedly behind the scenes who's told someone within the White House, you know, the, the, the US Air Force is hiding stuff, uh, let's say. Yeah, th that's really interesting. And um, I know that there were journalists looking to verify those claims officially, so it could be reported and have some weight behind it. But that's going to be very, very difficult to do, I think. Right. Uh, it's it's certainly an interesting story. And I mean, what I did as soon as I was told by Ross, I looked to see if I could confirm with my own sources. So what you look to do is you look to confirm with sources that aren't connected. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is it more credence in a way if those sources might not even know each other so if they're hearing the same thing then you could have like say with relatively com relative confidence that these astonishing claims may have some weight to them so i managed to do that and then when i came out basically backing up what ross said another source then confirmed to me that yes this is this is seems to be correct but look um at the moment that that their claims um but obviously <laughs> if anyone could verify it would be a it'd be a huge story well, you know, one of the things that I that I think is interesting is okay. So you had this you had this Chinese balloon uh, that was uh, clearly some kind of intelligence platform, uh, and then you had the three un unidentified uh, vehicles that were shot down. That were I believe the Pentagon never referred to them as uh, as balloons. Uh, I forgot exactly what they said, but then it's like. All of a sudden, there's nothing. So you're telling me in just like a one week period that boom, all of a sudden stuff's floating around in the sky and getting shot down. You know, we've never heard of this before, and now all of a sudden it's dead silence again. It's I just I just think it's uh, it's 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 very very uh, very very interesting. Do you expect any sort of statement from? Pentagon spokesman Susan Go about uh, these images that Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp uh, leak, uh, received out of a leak. I think it would be unfair to do that as of yet because you know Susan Goff didn't even know it existed. The Arrow didn't even have it, so this is brand new information coming to them. Uh, so I'm not looking to push them. I mean, by all means, if other journalists do want to push them on that, that's fine. Um, I did speak to Goff today. And uh, she just confirmed to me that, um, that there's various um, scientific um, studies that are being conducted um, by um, Kirkpatrick. Um, let me just see if I can find the exact wording of what she said to me, actually. Um, so, I mean, that there's because obviously this paper came out with, um, with Abby Loeb. Uh, what she said to me was, and by the way, like I go on at Susan Goff quite a lot, but um, uh, you know, I, I do have my problems about how she's kind of like characterized Lou and the role of the public affairs office, kind of like not providing clarity, but right. they do provide a lot more information than like the Ministry of Defense, for instance. Okay. So, 
they, they, are, they are good. They do work with you. And um, yeah, basically what she says is she, she was saying that the Arrow is taking a collaborative objective and data-driven approach to its mission and partnering with a right, wide range of stakeholders, including academia. As part of its work, the Arrow is developing several peer-reviewed articles on UAP with the scientific community. So yeah, it seems that a lot more is kind of like in the works in terms of what they're doing in terms of scientific background. But so I did digress there. What was your point again? Oh, no, I was just, I was asking, do you, do you foresee uh, Susan Goff go, you know, whatever the hell her name is, uh, uh, do you see her, uh, do you see her issuing some kind of statement confirming the authenticity of the video? You know, previous stuff that Jeremy Corbell has released after the fact, go Goff, Water, whatever uh, has has come you know come out and said yes this is actually real footage this isn't like something uh, Corbell just pulled out of nowhere it's 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 the real deal so do you do you think uh, do you predict that uh, Susan Gogoff will uh, will make a statement uh, confirming the authenticity of it what's what's your gut feeling on that. It's a difficult one, and there is some background on why she actually did confirm the original like footage you know, back in um, of the West Coast incidents that were obtained by by, by Corbell and um, and now there, there's a reason why she did uh, confirm that, and that information will be made clear hopefully within the next few days um, and weeks ahead in terms of why she did that. But um, there is a reason why she confirmed those ones, and she hasn't really since um, confirmed other images. Um, right. So yeah, um, that will be coming out kind of like in the near future. But uh, you, you mentioned the object shot down as well um, over the, um, the United States and, and Canada. That, that's really interesting as well. I mean, I still seem to believe that these were likely prosaic objects. Um, but I mean, some people have suggested that they may have not been. Um, I spoke to the Canadian um, Royal, um, the, the Mounties, the Royal Mounted um, Police. Oh gosh, I probably screwed that up. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and um, they're ba I, I basically said to them, I said, look, you, you've given up the search, but look, are you going to reconvene the search when weather conditions improve? So, you know, That's a good point. Summer, no, they don't. Right. <laughs> they're not going to. Uh, which seems, seems really surprising because, like, you went to all that effort, you know, you spent, like, all that money, like, on the missiles, taking these things down, for example, or in terms of the United States, I guess. But you're not going to find out what it is. You're not going to go to greater lengths. Right. Uh, that was really strange to me. And, um, I mean, it just brought me back to um, some of the early UAP cases from the 1940s. And um, did you know, for example, that... The first kind of engagement where like a pilot engaged with a UFO, it was over the skies of Michigan. I think really? it was like 19, yeah, I think it was like 1945. Wow. Um, it's okay. like Timothy Good's books. And it was like a, it was a French, French pilot who was um, basically on loan with the US Air Force. Okay. And um, he, it was a, a balloon. So he was told to go out and shoot it because I think they were like Soviet or Nazi balloons that used to put up in the skies and stuff like that, and it would sometimes wander over. So he was kind of like told, yeah, go up and shoot that balloon down. And um, I think then he like basically said that I soon found out that it wasn't a balloon. Right. <laughs> he claimed that like a saucer zipped out when he started shooting on it. Um, uh, so I found that quite interesting. And it was like a case in, I think it was Peru as well, back in like 1978, when they thought there was like a balloon hovering over an Air Force base, and they sent out like one of the best pilots to shoot it down, thinking it was like a foreign su a surveillance asset. And then this so-called balloon kept like jumping up in height, and like, <laughs> the pilot couldn't shoot it. And every time he fired it, it jumped up again and evaded action before he could do anything. And he claims that he got up to like sixty thousand feet, something like that, and he just wasn't able to do it. And um, he had to like go back before he ran out of fuel. Uh, so, like, I think that was like detailed in one of Leslie Keane's books, actually. So it brought me back to wow. those. But um, still sticking to these are most likely prosaic. But I just thought it was interesting anyway. Just um, it brought me back to some of those earlier cases. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. No. For sure. Um, yeah, yeah, going back to the whole Air Force thing, and I believe this was in your article. I'd have to skim through it, but uh, uh, that the U.S. Air Force had a reporting procedure for UAP. Was that in your article? I'm thinking about. Uh, 
or am I uh, is yeah. that somewhere else? And and that and that right. it was they only did it for a very short period of time. Is that right? Yes, I confirmed that. So they had a pilot program which started in November 2020, and um, they did it for six months, and they, they they didn't extend it basically, which looks really really bad now, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I'd say <laughs> so. Like, yeah, and then, and then you had um, and then you had um, in August 2021, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall telling Politico that you know I've given a great deal of thought about defending American airspace, but not against UFOs. If asked to do that, then I will do it. This is a thing that's been around for a great many years. I mean, that's just like so dumb because you know we don't know what UFOs are. That's the whole point. I mean, if you're right. going to give great thought about not defending against UFOs, but defending against China, well, that's really dumb because you know, <laughs> we don't know if these UFOs are Chinese in origin or for anything else. You know, the fact they're unidentified means that you know, there could be like a vulnerability and there could be a gap in your knowledge in terms of um, foreign surveillance systems. You know, it seems to me like a, a very, very good strategy for a foreign power to actually send something that kind of like mimics UAP that they kind of like ignore all the time because then you've got like a free reign because no one's going to be willing to um, to to investigate. I mean, ex the stigma of UAP is also like a, a, a gap, I guess, in and what you can kind of like exploit, <laughs> um, uh, which is uh, which is quite frightening. So um, yeah, it, it's certainly interesting. Yeah, you know, and and it it would if if they you know if the U.S. Air Force is only uh, running a program to let their their uh, pilots report for a, you know such a, a short period of time, uh, then of course it's it's the Air Force is so dysfunctional, uh, purposefully in my opinion. Uh, on this particular subject, it's 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 no wonder this stuff didn't get reported up the chain to arrow. Uh, but you know, one thing, military folks understand the chain of command. That is that is uh, is essential. So, to you know, if the Air Force were to come out and say, "Oh, you know, we just forgot to send this uh, footage up to arrow," uh, I don't believe it for a second. Uh, and you know, and and Frank Kendall, I I uh, if I were a senator, uh, I in the United States Congress, I would be calling him on the carpet to testify in a open hearing as to why they are lying to the public and why the United States Air Force uh, is being non-cooperative. Frank Kendall, the buck stops uh, with him uh, as Secretary of the Air Force. And uh, folks in Congress, if you're listening to this, uh, it's it's high time. Uh, this guy is basically giving you the middle finger and uh, and saying that uh, you know we we don't need to cooperate with uh, what you as Congress uh, has legally demanded. And and my I'm no lawyer, but I I firmly believe that that uh, the United States Air Force is uh, or at least their leadership are, are clearly. Uh, breaking uh, breaking laws, uh, you know. So one of the things that I'd love for you to kind of touch on um, the one, one bit of news that we we heard recently, and we were actually the first uh, first to break this, is that members or, or people that were involved in uh, historical UAP crash retrieval programs were testifying in a in a skiff uh, to Sean Kirkpatrick at Arrow, and that uh, and that they were also some of these. People involved in these legacy uh, these legacy crash retrieval programs were also testifying to certain senators. What uh, what have you heard, and uh, what what's your kind of uh, or what do you think about all of that? Yeah, so obviously these um, intelligence authorization act language, which eventually made its way within the um, national defense authorization act, um, uh, didn't come from nowhere in terms of the whistleblower language. It came because people came up to. Senate Intelligence Committee members, that, right. that's how it came about. So we know that there was initial uh, whistleblowers who came forward. Um, look, we already know the names of one of them. We, we know that Eric Davis, for example, has spoken to, um, uh, to, to con people within Congress, for instance. So, I did not know uh, that. Well, he was the one who went to the New York Times. Um, uh, and there was a story about, about the... Um, I think it was the reverse engineering or something like that, but he went to New York Times in terms of um, 
materials or something along, along those lines anyhow so um that that's already published basically unless, unless i'm getting that totally wrong but from my understanding that did happen and what's happened from my understanding is that um since those initial whistleblowers came forward to uh, um the senate intelligence committee there have been others that have come forward as well and there have been um, private testimonies given um, within, within Congress um, to committees. Um, so more and more people have been coming out. But it, it's a very, very sensitive topic to actually talk about at this moment. But I did mention that there seems to be a critical mass building up. That's correct. More and more people are coming forward um, from, from what I've heard. But look, everything is fluid. I mean, I reported back in, I think it was like November, a source told me that, look, straight away after the NDAA is signed into law by Biden, there's going to be hearings. But look, that didn't transpire in the end because it, it, it is a fluid situation going on at the moment. So in terms of these people coming forwards, what will happen is that they need, that their claims need to be verified to a certain extent, whereby congress can be very very satisfied and confident that what they're saying is correct and has truth behind it um i would also go as far as to say as ross has also said as well that this very very senior person within the united states military and the the, the u.s navy has provided information about legacy programs to the biden administration as well so look it, it does seem that it's reaching this critical mass, but yeah, the, the same problem exists. You need to verify that information. To what extent can you verify it? And then obviously when you, when you do verify it, and if you do verify it, then you have to make a decision of how much you tell the public about, about this. So, so that's another decision that has right. to be made. So th th there it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to kind of like say, this is definitely going to happen 100 percent or this is going to happen it's going to happen it's going to happen at this time and it's very very difficult because things are in flux but i can tell you that yeah more and more people are coming forward and um i think yeah like people seem to be getting excited and i can tell you as well that look before these um these shoot downs happened people behind the scenes were very very excited that progress of in dc was accelerating um hugely uh so there is excitement but Look, I, I always just say, look, just be calm, let's continue just to kind of like push the ball forwards and see what transpires, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be watching and I'm gonna be reporting what I can when I can. Right. No, uh, that yeah, it's uh yeah, so I've been hearing hearing the same the uh, the same things and and uh you know the folks that I've heard from are people in government that are uh that are involved in this particular topic and they have said unequivocally that crash retrieval programs uh, are are real, uh, and they've been around for a, uh, quite a while, and um, and that it's you know that's really been the thing that this one source said to me. He goes, um, you know, he said there there are certain things about crash retrievals that should never be made public due to national security concerns. Um, you know, for instance, any information that would allow China or Russia to be able, if they, which apparently they do, they have uh, retrieved crash uh, off-world uh, vehicles as well. If they, if we get, accidentally gave out information that would allow them to figure out how to weaponize these particular things, so his point was was that there there are certain things like that that should never be in the public domain. But the point he he made was that. There is no good reason to not re to not release or or admit the existence of these programs and to admit that we have crashed intact off world uh, off world vehicles uh, and that it's it's there's no there's no good reason to uh, to keep that under wraps and um, you know and my understanding is that all of this stuff is 
is uh, spread out. These, this legacy program is spread out uh, not only in private aerospace, but this information exists at other top levels of, uh, of governments, uh, sort of in, in nodes. And the gatekeepers of this particular thing, uh, these crash retrieval programs, there are, there's a huge financial interest in it. Um, you know, and, and one question people, you know, people often ask is, is why would, you know, why would they, uh, you know, keep this so secret, so under wraps? And, you know, and I, I think the answer to this is that, you know, th these folks, especially the United States Air Force, understand that what, what they have been doing all along would, could very likely or would very likely put them in jail. Uh, so if you're if you're involved in in uh, this whole this whole issue, uh, and you know that you're in serious legal or serious criminal jeopardy, I mean that's that's a that's a powerful incentive to not uh, you know not spill the beans on it. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So that that's uh, just kind of my my feeling my feeling on that. And I do believe that uh, in addition to the uh, the cases of, of UAPs disabling our our land based strategic nuclear deterrent, uh, which I believe is probably one of the prime reasons the Air Force uh, has been illegally hiding this from Congress. Uh, the the second, of course, would be uh, would be crash retrievals. So um, so if you don't mind, let's uh, let's go to a couple questions here. And and thank you uh, always, Chris, for the generosity of your time. I know it's uh, it's getting uh, getting late there. Um, so, and sorry, I haven't gone uh, through this. Okay, so question, this is from uh, Naive. Uh, I, actually, let me give a shout out to uh, Saw, uh, Saw1P, or P Saw1. I'm probably butchering your name, but uh, we always see you on here, so we really appreciate you joining. Uh, actually, let me give a shout out. So, uh, Naive Essence, thank you uh, uh, for joining us. Uh, Avi M, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for hopping on with us. Uplifting tweets, I love this guy. Uh, if you guys... If if you go on UFO Twitter, you will always see something funny from this uplifting tweets guy. He's a graphic and he comedy genius. Them. What's that, Chris? <laughs> he's the meme master, isn't he? <laughs> he's he's fantastic. Uh, Christian Morales, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Red Panda Koala, uh, hey. uh, thank you. Uh, Salab uh, Salameb, uh, again, probably uh, uh, butchering the name. Okay, so let's get to a couple questions here. Uh, this uh, question comes from Naive Essence, uh, uh, part one, Chris uh, Sharp. Uh, Elizondo, Taylor, and Stratton were part of new efforts to study UAP. Can we expect any shocking revelations from them soon or the real? I'm not sure what that last part means. But, uh, uh, yeah, so what, uh, what do you think? Do you is, predict any, uh, if, if you had your uh, crystal ball there, do you think that we would uh, uh, see uh, any... Uh, Shocking new revelations from these folks. They've, they've been kind of quiet, especially Elizondo. Yeah, I think there's going to be <clears throat> some more revelations from 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 Stratton. Definitely, there's a lot of things to get into still uh, <clears throat> in terms of some of the stuff that's happened. Um, uh, Lou Lou's going to have his book coming out. Uh, I believe that's being reviewed at the moment by the uh, by the D Department of Defense. So. I think that will have um, some pretty cool revelations, and I'm hoping that Lou kind of starts doing interviews again af after that. Uh, so I think you can expect possibly some more revelations within that book as well. Uh, but but that book's going to be very very interesting uh, for a lot of reasons which I can't get into at the moment. But um, I, I think it's something definitely to uh, to look at, look out for. And look, Lou, Lou's such a a lovely. A lovely guy as well. He's full of wisdom, and um, I think it's yeah, it will be about UAP, but it might just also be about kind of his life as well, which seems to be quite interesting in terms of a lot of his experiences. So um, yeah, I can't I can't wait for that to come out as well. Yeah, I, I can't either. Lou Elizondo, if you're listening, we've never talked, we've never messaged, but you are welcome to come on the show anytime. You are are uh, my hero as well as a hero to a lot of others. So Lou Elizondo, if you're listening. DM me, okay? My DMs are open. Uh, yeah, so, you know, going back, going back, sorry, I had to do a little plug there <laughs> and beg for Lou to come on my show. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I think would be great, and I hope to hell he does this, is in his book, he is going to say, I was director of ATIP. So let's say that he does say that, which I, 
if I had a thousand bucks, I'd bet right now he's going to. Uh, that 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 book is going through Pentagon review. If he was not the director of ATIP during that Pentagon review, they are going to come back and say that is false, and they're going to make him change it. So uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, uh, Basement Boy, Green Street, and uh, some of these other folks will finally uh, uh, get shut down with their uh, uh, ridiculous uh, ridiculousness. So, but yeah, I'm I cannot wait to uh, to uh, uh, for for Lou's book to come out. And Lou, what better place to plug your book than on the Good Trouble Show? That's all I'm saying. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, sorry, I had to I couldn't resist. Uh, okay, so, so that was question part one. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, Revelation soon. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, let's see what else uh, do we have here. It might be, uh, might not. Uh, okay, so Christian, I'd love to know why the Air Force isn't talking. Perhaps they've done some bad stuff, uh, lies, 100%, but uh, they may even have more dirt. I mean, they tried debunking Roswell and Project Mogul. Uh, pathetic. Any, uh, I, mean, I think we kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, I would add that, that when we're talking events over the Middle East, for example, it might not be a conspiracy. It might just be that the Air Force are very, very mission focused. Um, it doesn't think that these are important in terms of some of the um, things that they're dealing with in terms of, you know, drones attacking airports and um, and other threats basically ongoing. It might be due to that or something. But um, I think you have to distinguish between some of the very, very good guys who are just like normal members of the US Air Force are very, very frustrated by what's happening. Um, uh, and then you've got to distinguish that with, um, with the, the, the people above um, who are making all the key decisions and stuff. So uh, I would caution at doing that. It's, uh, it's definitely an interesting situation. I remember when um, it was a great article by The Debrief, I think it was read, written by Mika Hanks, and it had one of the... Um, former US Air Force um, generals, Jack Weinstein, basically arguing back when National Defense Authorization Act was going into law establishing a UFO office. And he was basically arguing, oh, this isn't important at all. There are many, many more important things than UFO. This is a waste of time. You shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be doing this in terms of opening up an office or stuff to look into UFOs. And, you know, he's quoted now. That quote's going to go down in history. It already looks really, really bad. So right. I think you have to ask yourself why there was such resistance to look into this. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, and and just to clarify as well, my, my problem is not with uh, the uh, United States Air Force, the, the men and women that serve. My problem is with the U.S. Air Force leadership. Uh, you know, I believe that that it's a dereliction of duty uh, to this country of what they're doing. And, you know, if what kind of democracy is is, you know, is you know, what kind of democracy is this in the United States when you have the leadership of a armed branch subverting the will of Congress? Uh, it's un-American. It's uh, unpatriotic. Uh, and. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, what you were just, uh, you know, those two quotes, uh, quotes you were talking about uh, from uh, uh, the Secretary of the, of the Air Force and, and the gentleman you just spoke about. I mean, that, that, that tells you a lot. There is a reason. There is a reason that they are trying to hide this, I guarantee you. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. This is from uh, Xavier. Uh, does Chris have any insight to the uh, insight into the to uh, to the Stars Academy, or uh, I think they've kind of rebranded themselves? Uh, any uh, any thoughts or information on that? No, not so much at the moment. I think a lot because I've been mainly focused on a lot of the um, congressional activity, and I know that started out with um, Lou and Chris under. Um, the flag of TTSA, but that's not so much happening anymore. And it looks as though Tom is now focusing his efforts on the entertainment aspects, what he's doing. Right. Uh, and I think the other day as well, he like put a call out for, for, for UFO materials and stuff like that. So I think they might be doing the scientific stuff at the moment as well. So I'm not sure I, I, I need to speak to some of the, um, to the shareholders perhaps to see if they've got any updates. <laughs> um, but I've not heard a lot. Got it. Yeah, no, I, and I, I haven't as, as well. Uh, we'll do a couple more questions here. Uh, Naive Essence. 
thoughts on the Avi Loeb and Arrow director, uh, 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 Arrow, uh, the director of Arrow, their joint white paper on UAP? Any uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's so obviously it looks like they're setting a baseline there, um, and it seems to me like they they they're, they're looking for extraordinary evidence basically, and and they're suggesting that you know some sensor systems might be wrong for example but this is what we're trying to cut for at the moment so one of the questions that i asked at a um at a round table then um before before christmas i believe it was in december i asked um kirkpatrick and moultrie say look have you seen anything coming from space for example coming into the earth's atmosphere have you seen a uap they will not talk about that <laughs> and avi yep. Loeb has already said that he's not being given materials that are um that are classified so it's difficult for him to really take a rounded view um from his own perspective of what this could be but i mean it seems to me that they're suggesting that if it doesn't create a sonic boom um or if it doesn't have an amount of um electric um it doesn't have an amount of heat um signatures coming in when it's going really fast and um that then it isn't real or something like that, you know. But you know, we know we know the fact that um, you know NASA, for example, are working on um, an aircraft at the moment where they're trying to limit the sonic boom so that people don't hear anything. And now you can have flights um, going over the, the mainland, basically, of the United States that are going up those huge speeds. Like you know, Concorde, for instance, Concorde could only fly over you know, from London to the, to New York. It couldn't go like mainland or anything like that because the the sonic boom that it would cause. Um, so they're actively looking into um, into into doing that. So, you know, for example, that you know we, we may already be developing things that don't create a sonic boom. So it just seems a little bit silly, I think, suggesting that. And I think it would be useful, perhaps, to also like when you're doing those kinds of papers to bring um, an engineer on board as well, um, an aerospace engineer who's kind of like on the cutting edge of this technology and could probably provide some more insight. Um, I'd say with the Ukraine one, for instance, I got something to say about that because I spoke to the, I got the videos actually of the Ukraine um, study showing these things. You can't really see much from them. And we didn't choose to go ahead with the story in the end because we weren't really getting straight answers from the study team. Um, however, I'd say it was a bit unfair to say that these were all artillery shells due to the conflict that's ongoing because that study started in 2018. That's when they started seeing these things, long before the war started. So you can't say that artillery shells have been flying over Kiev since 2018 on a regular basis and they're being mistaken by UAP. It just seems a little bit, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. If, I, I think that's a little bit of a, a rush conclusion to me. Um, I'm not saying... You know, but, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think they're anything extraordinary. Like I said, we weren't getting straight answers from that study group. What we wanted to do, we wanted to basically get for them to like give us like a step by step process of how you capture these things. And then what we would do is we'd go to some astronomers and say, look, this is a step by step, step process set up by these um, Ukrainian astronomers. Can we replicate it? That's what I was trying to do, so we could like prove it, you know. But they're unable to do that. So I mean, I can see it from both sides, really. But I don't necessarily agree that these things were artillery shells. Right. Yeah, I uh, I kind of kind of thought so as well. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the the uh, uh, the space part. I know that was something that former assistant uh, uh, of. Uh, Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Chris Mellon. By the way, Chris, come on our show. Uh, you know, he's mentioned that, he's, he's mentioned that several times uh, for Congress to ask that specific question. I think one of the things he was, uh, he was uh, uh, wanting Congress to ask uh, was something along the lines of, uh, uh, can you, uh, are there any, uh, are there any off-world vehicles in low Earth orbit uh, or something like that? Um, but yeah, that, that's one thing. The Air Force, that uh, sneaky little Air Force, uh, uh, you know, Frank Kendall there, uh, they don't want to touch that. You know, and I kind of wonder too, it's like if, again, it goes back to why is the Air Force lying about this? And, you know, maybe one reason, or, or, and why are they trying to like bury a conversation about it and not cooperate? Uh, I, you know, I kind of wonder is if they come out and say, yeah, these things are flying around in our skies or seeing them on our, uh, 
you know, in our uh, sensors at NORAD, all that kind of thing. To me, the next logical question I would ask the Air Force, if they, if they come up, Frank Kendall goes up and says, yeah, these things have been flying around, they're not from here, blah, blah, blah. The next question, if I were a journalist in, uh, in that news conference with uh, Secretary uh, Kendall, I would say, so do you guys have any crashed, uh, uh, crashed uh, uh, recoveries of these things? Uh, you know, so maybe that's one of the reasons that, that they are uh, avoiding it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Osvaldo, uh, as, well, I can't talk today, as Osvaldo, it's like me saying, uh, uh, oh, the obfuscated, it's like I flip a coin, uh, I'm 50-50 whether I'm not going to be able to pronounce it, but Osvaldo Franco uh, on Disclosure Rev Revolution on Twitter had uh, had this video of him going up to Senator Gillibrand. Uh, it was some kind of press event, and he specifically asked her about the UAP thing. And one of what she stated was that uh, Sean Kirkpatrick, the director of Aero, had not been able to get any historical uh, information on UAP. Uh, and I, I believe he she specifically said from the Air Force. Uh, I'm not real sure about that, but uh, it was it was along that line, uh, along those lines, and, and she had said, uh, "Well, if you can't get, if if the Pentagon's not going to cooperate with their own office, uh, you know, just get uh, get the current stuff." Um, do you have uh, time for a few more questions? How how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. Yeah, people okay. have spent, you know, people have made the time and effort to ask questions. Of course, yeah, please. Cool, cool. I, we, you know, bef uh, we uh, I had a couple of technical issues, so uh, we actually. <laughs> Never uh, said uh, when when your hard out uh, hard out is so uh, and and as always we appreciate the generosity of your time and and please uh, thank your family uh, for uh, for doing that uh, okay so uh, la, 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 la. Uh, so uh, alien girl hi alien girl thanks for joining us uh, naive essence uh, we asked a couple questions there uh, uh, red panda koala uh, says hello uh, Oswald also awesome actually that. That may have been uh, that may be may have been the end of our questions. Um, so so one thing that I've been hearing is that uh, in there's a good possibility uh, by summer some big things are going to happen. Have you heard uh, any sort of similar predictions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you tell them, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But let's Let's just say that wouldn't it be great if we had like, you know, a big office or um, agency, for example, that was led by someone who's an advocate for this issue, you know, be like having a Lloyd Austin, you know, imagine Lloyd Austin, for example, going up to the cameras and saying, oh, I'm really interested to get to the bottom of this UAP issue. Sure. You know, it's one of the mysteries of our time. I'm going to go all out to make sure that we're going to study this. Wouldn't it be great if we had someone um from a from another kind of like um agency or office let's say um who kind of like had that attitude and you know that kind of agency or office or whatever you know department could be anything you know um but that very thing happened to have lots of data as well about uap wouldn't, wouldn't that be great i mean that'd be that'd be awesome i mean sorry i'm just pondering to myself here um probably just rattling on sorry yeah um, no it's all good time <laughs> Do uh, so. Here's a question uh, from Xavier: Are there any talks behind the scenes of public hearings this year? And if so, would we expect it to go similar uh, to the last? Which, <laughs> let's, let's face it, uh, it was a bit of a, a clown show with uh, with uh, Moultrie, uh, who, by the way, uh, Ronald Moultrie, uh, he has a extensive. Uh, extensive LinkedIn profile of all of the corporations that he has worked for. But guess what Ronald Moultrie never put in his LinkedIn profile? The fact that he was on the advisory board of Battelle, Battelle, how I understand it, uh, has been involved in analysis of uh, crashed, uh, uh, off-world crashed material. So, uh, uh, Ronald Moultrie, feel free to uh, uh, DM us and uh, and let us know why Battelle is not on your extensive list, uh, your extensive public resume on LinkedIn. Anyway, I went off on the side thing there. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, so what do you think? I mean, it, uh, Moultrie and uh, Scott Bray from the Navy uh, clown show would have been the best way to put it. 
uh, I, uh, I sort of nicknamed them uh, plausible and deniability. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so have you heard anything about any upcoming uh, hearings or talk of it, and do you think it would go any better uh, than the last one? Uh, how do I answer this question? It's a tricky one. So I can comment on the, the um, information that I had initially received back in November about, you know, possible kind of like DOD uh, themed hearings, let's say. Um, like, it's kind of like 50-50 now with that definitely happens in the near future. They are prepping people, that there are identifying people who could possibly speak. Yes, that's going on. Um, but whether it happens um, in the near future, I, I don't think it's um, it, it's dead set to happen or not. But um, yeah, but hearings, um, hearings are interesting. Um, keep talking about hearings. Um, yeah, don't, don't rule hearings out. Um, yeah, there are a lot of ways this can transpire, let's say. Um, but beyond that, I'm not going to comment on what I may or may not know. But um, it's interesting. Keep asking the questions. Keep looking. And um, yeah, perhaps we'll have something released about the theme of hearings in the near future. I, I certainly hope that there would be a Senate hearing on this. And uh, uh, Senator Gillibrand or Senator Rubio, if you're, uh, if you're listening, ask about Battelle. Um, uh, anyway, what, have you heard anything about uh, what, uh, what John Podesta is up to? Is he perhaps involved behind the scenes in any of the uh, UAP efforts, do you think? Yeah, I think there was, um, there was, there was enthusiasm to see him kind of like be majorly involved in, you know, a, a study of UAP from the White House, but um also that would be quite difficult because he's got another job in terms of being like an energy czar um within the white house um but i definitely believe look the guy has major influence and is someone that biden trusts um as well as his chief of staff as well so um uh, I, I could foresee definitely scenarios where you know people within the white house will be seeking his counsel on the UAP topic and maybe taking his guidance. And um, yeah, I, I could see him pushing for this behind the scenes most definitely. And look, none of the other people have gone away as well who were involved in this from the outset when Tom started getting involved. So um, yeah, always remember, you know, where, where this came from. And, um, you know, you know, Red, Red Panda, um, you know, he's one of the guys that inspired me to like start looking into this in the analytical approach that I take. And um, yeah, his video about Tom DeLonge's history is very, very relevant. And I can say that, yeah, it's gonna be looked back in history, that video is, and people are gonna put the pieces together and think, gosh, this guy was ahead of his time. Right. His analysis was absolutely on target and uh, maybe more than he knows, um, definitely, but yeah. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a lot to. Sorry, going ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. There's a lot. There's a lot to. There's a lot to this story. Uh, there's there's a lot to it, and uh, yeah, I think defense contractors. I think look, they're in a situation at the moment where a lot of the top talent is going to the sexier companies. You know, the the uh, SpaceX's, for example. Lots of the top talent is going going for those. Not necessary to Lockheed Martin anymore. Or, or some of the other defense contractors. So they're losing out on some of the best talent now. So there is an issue with recruitment and the number of like, you know, trained engineers being trained in the US, for example, it may not be as much as it was. So look, I, I think there is a need for more people to work on this. And I don't necessarily it's in the, see that it's in the best interest for a Lockheed, let's say, or a Raytheon to keep this quiet. It may be to its benefit to actually get this thing open. Um, that's something that I theorize. Um, and look, I said before, look, if the Chinese are working on this, um, they can, they can, yeah, they, they can get a lot more people working on this because there's like one communist member for every like 10 people in the population in China. So that they, you know, they can keep stuff a secret better than, you know, an open country like the USA or, or the UK, for example. So, um, that they're, they're, it may be in the best interest when you think about it pragmatically for both corporations and for the US government 
in terms of getting things out. And I'd also say as well that, look, it's, and I was unfair last time as well, because we kind of like see China as an antagonist going after Taiwan and things like that. But I mean, it, it, there are people like in any country who are good and who are bad. And I believe there are people within China as well that do see this as something that could perhaps usher in an age of security and peace. Look, all it takes is like one conflict, you right. know, with the Taiwan, for example. You could do a blockade of China, and within a year, you could see a situation where like 500 million people could be on the brink of starvation because not enough food is coming into them. They need to support that giant population of theirs. So it, it's, it's a difficult situation for them as well. And, you know, we do know that there was a Chinese effort. And look, nothing goes on in China, you know, public or privately, without the government kind of like giving its go ahead to do right. so. And you had this really big effort in China, the, I think it was like the Five Continents Forum that Red, um, Red Panda reported on. And that was real. And, you know, the, the aim was to establish an effort in the United Nations, uh, perhaps take it to San Marino. So th there are people within China that do want to see this kind of like bring the world together as well, not just the USA. Um, and look, I think also, like, I'll, I'll give a big shout out to Paolo Grisardi because what he has done in terms of getting San Marino to take the UFO topic to the UN it is a monumental, monumental story. And I don't, I don't think any other, like, English speaking media organization, apart from Liberation Times, has reported on that story, which is crazy because I, I think, you know, looking back, I think we'll look at this project Titan is a major step forward. And, you know, it's one of the pillars that Lou, Lou Elizondo identified um, to start up with. So, um, yeah. Um, is that Lou yeah, calling? Sorry. Is that Lou Elizondo calling? No comment who calls on my phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's... <laughs> You you can pick it up. It's okay. Yeah, uh, I'm sure our uh, the question board would uh, start uh, start <laughs> start lighting up with with even more <laughs> more stuff. Uh, yeah, I, just real quick, I wanted uh, uh, to point out uh, there was a uh, who said this question, um, uh, but uh, yeah, but someone going through the uh, the uh, uh, the chat here. But yeah, someone just making the point that again. Uh, our problem is not with uh, the United States Air Force writ large. The problem is with the bad apples in their leadership uh, that are that are uh, not uh, allowing this thing to uh, 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 be properly uh, properly investigated. Um, uh, I'll go ahead. I will leave you there. Look, there are some religious bonkers people around, yeah, but like Stratton said, they, they have less leverage now. But look, there may be a real concern. We might look back and think, actually, we can see where these people are coming from if they didn't want this information out. Lou has said before that it could seem that these things are prepping the battlefield, and you right. have to not let up that you know what they're doing. So if you do do that then you could trigger a response sooner rather than later. So they might just be concerned. So I put that in people's mind as well. Yeah, no, I think that's that's definitely a possibility. And for people that don't know what uh, what the concept of preparation of battlefield is, if if you're a uh, a country that is going to invade another country, uh, you send in intelligence operatives, uh, you send, send in people covertly to gather intelligence gather intelligence on that country, on uh, everything that goes on there from their military offensive capabilities, military defensive capabilities, their intelligence uh, capabilities, all of those things. And, uh, and you have those operatives in there for a period of time, as long as possible, to feed information back to you when you're, uh, so you can plan your invasion. Well, let's say that all of these, uh, in, uh, these folks that you've covertly inserted were uh, were discovered, uh, the invading country would be like, hey, the jig's up, let's go on ahead and invade. And that's that's the concept of preparation of battlefield. And that is something that I've heard heard uh, Lou, uh, Lou speak about. You know, I also, this was a thought that I had had the other night. So uh, as I've told you in, in, in great detail in private, I haven't really spoken publicly a lot about it. Uh, when I began messaging on this uh, a little over a year ago, 
and uh, had this call with the senator's uh, national security advisor that confirmed that, yeah, all of this stuff is indeed real. Uh, all of a sudden, I, UAPs began showing up at my house uh, uh, and uh, four separate times. The, the last one was about uh, two, two weeks ago. Uh, and also, in, around that same time, I had that conversation with the senator's national security, security advisor. I also began having extensive interviews with Robert Hastings, the author of UFO and Nukes. And he's an experiencer. And uh, so, because in my life, I would never had anything happen. And I've had paranormal stuff happen in the house. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. And once I saw it, with my own eyes, then I totally knew it was real. But but I I truly believe that um, uh, this hitchhiker effect is uh, is a uh, is a real deal. I I'm I feel I'm sort of living proof of that. And uh, uh, and I'm going to tell a story. I actually told this on on Spaced Out Radio, which I was a guest on uh, last uh, last week. Um, so. Uh, so there's there is a uh, you know so I'm uh, fairly active in in promoting for the Democratic Party and of course have a lot of political connections there and I received on uh, last I believe it was last Friday a phone call with one of my political contacts that is a political operative uh, in D.C. very well known. Uh, and uh, I'll just say that this person had never had anything happen in their entire life. And uh, this person has a uh, penthouse uh, on uh, the Florida coast. And this person was having uh, a, a dinner party with four other guests. And uh, so she calls me up in this panic. And she's like, I can't believe what just happened. And uh, while they were out watching this thing, they saw these lights off in, uh, in the distance. And before they knew it, uh, a two giant Tic Tacs uh, were right in front of them. Uh, they, they caught it on film, uh, and uh, uh, they zipped around. You know, I asked her how they moved, and, and she said it was like unlike anything I had ever seen. Uh, this person is actually a, uh, someone retired in the science field, and all she kept saying was that, I know physics, and uh, the, this, is, uh, this is unlike anything I had ever seen. So while this is happening, the four dinner guests run off in a panic. And, and this person is friends with presidents, senators. Uh, uh, this person is extremely highly connected in the political world uh, and advocates uh, in that. Uh, and uh, anyway, yeah, so you know, she, all she kept saying is, why all of a sudden, why did, why did I see this? And, and I said, well, it's most likely because you and I have spoken. Uh, this particular person has been the one that's facilitated uh, my political connections uh, with people on Capitol Hill. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I know it's kind of a long-winded thing, but, but it kind of, uh, I, I do believe that the hitchhiker thing is real. And so then it, it, one kind of hypothesis that I've had is, if, if we know that if, if I've experienced the phenomenon and I talk to this person and then they experience the phenomenon, like what just happened to my friend in Florida, uh, you know, clearly, as I think uh, Gar Dr. Gary Nolan has said, you know, this thing can kind of spread like a virus. So if you're the government and you admit this thing and all of a sudden, all, <coughs> excuse me, all of these people start engaging with the phenomenon, how does the phenomenon react? is all of a sudden it's, you know, we're going to have this stuff everywhere. So, um, so I've kind of wondered if, if they know that this thing has the ability to spread through ways that we don't understand, uh, you know, maybe that's a reason that they've tried to keep this under wraps. So maybe there are, there are good reasons. Um, anyway, I digress. Um, oh, so yeah, here's a good question. Keith Taylor, we haven't spoken about this. What about the undersea phenomenon? That's something that, that we haven't heard about recently, especially with uh, what's been going on with uh, the balloons. Have, have you heard any more uh, development-wise in terms of the undersea phenomenon aspect of this? Yeah, so this is one of the main aims of Arrow now to actually um, combat the stigma when it comes to submariners and to get some more testimonies, more data from 
um, the undersea phenomena as well. So this is one of their aims going forward in terms of collecting data. Um, but look, um, like in the West Coast incidents, you know, these things appear to be coming from, from the sea, <laughs> going into the sea sometimes as well. So uh, look, we, we should keep an eye on what's going on in our oceans. There's a lot that we haven't explored yet. Um, especially off that Catalina coast. And uh, yeah, it, it's very, very interesting. It, it's, yeah, it, it's something that people should definitely keep an eye on. I think we're going to hear more about it in the, the months months to come. Definitely. I think it's going to play a bigger role. Yeah, I, uh, I hope so. Uh, you know, Red, uh, just going back to the hitchhiker thing, Red, po Red Panda Koala, uh, you know, said he gets nervous about the whole world uh, being uh, hitchhiked. <laughs> so I, I think that's uh, an interesting thing. Uh, last, last, uh, last sort of question here. Um, a while back, uh, you were part of a, a telephone press conference uh, with the DOD regarding the UAP phenomenon. It was yourself and uh, other, other journalists. Uh, I understand uh, it was uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick that was on this call, and uh, uh, who and um, uh, Ronald Moultrie was on there as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, that was before Arrow got moved out of OUSDINS. Yeah. <laughs> How was Ronald Moultrie on that call? Very, very guarded. Like when you asked the question, Kirkpatrick could like open up and say, "Oh, yeah, there are interesting." Like characteristics, then Moultrie would say, yeah, but, you know, you've been in, but saying that's because of the phenomenology from the sensors and stuff like that, you know, try to downplay it. So um, you, you could see that um, Kirkpatrick didn't really have that much experience in terms of press, and he was probably going to be more forthcoming, uh, whereas Moultrie would just kind of like be the one kind of like shutting things down. Like, no, we are not going to discuss anything in terms of what's coming from space. So, yeah, he pretty much shut everything down that he could or just like down downplayed everything that he could. So that was like what Moultrie seemed to be doing, intent on doing in, in, in that meeting. Yeah, I would say, uh, let's just say you're a, a gatekeeper of this information and you uh, might have been involved in the, <clears throat> the tell. And, uh, uh, you know, the, that would be the person that you would want to, uh, let's just say, uh, manage uh, Kirkpatrick to make sure he doesn't say uh, the wrong thing. Uh, wrong things. Uh, this is all speculation on my part, but uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, so uh, uh, any uh, sort of last words or, uh, or thoughts uh, on this subject or anything you want to say uh, uh, to the viewers? No, I just want to thank everyone for, um, for, for watching, spending the time, um, you know, listening to me and thank you for all your support. It, it's, it does get hard, um, but I'm going to keep on pushing as much as I can um because i think you guys you know deserve the truth and um i want to know as well i'm just going to try and do it as i always have done um and put maximum effort time and analyze and make this a credible topic to bring forwards and hopefully i can make a little bit of difference to make sure that we get answers sooner than you know than may have otherwise been so yeah thank you for your support it means everything to me every kind word you say to me it really makes my day. So, so just thank you for being kind to me, really. Thank you. Yeah, no, well, I, I uh, you know, thank you. I mean, you're, like I said, you're you're pursuing this with the rigor of uh, the Washington Post journalists. And, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're classy, you're kind, and, you know, you're really doing uh, the work that uh, the other people that should be are not. And I, I firmly believe uh, when all of this comes down, you will be uh, definitely a page in the history book of how all of this, uh, all this, all of this came about. So, how can uh, how can viewers find your work? Uh, yes, so if you go on to www.liberationtimes.com, that's my website, so you can view my work on there. Uh, the Roswell Daily Record as well. Um, it, that's going to be it's going to be printed there. I'm immensely proud. I can't help but smile when I think about that. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well, so it's um, Chris UK Sharp, um, which is my handle, and then Liberation Times, which is Liberation Times, out of space. So, yeah, check me out. Um, uh, yeah, just feel free to ask me anything anytime I'm on Twitter, and yeah, and uh, just thank you, thank you for um, for watching me. Yeah, continue to be kind to one another, and that's what counts.
Right, yeah. And uh, Ronald Moultrie, if you're listening, uh, my question to you, are you still on the advisory board of Battelle? Uh, my DMs are open. Uh, uh, I'm really curious about that. Something there. Uh, anyway, folks, if you enjoyed this show, uh, we appreciate your follow, your retweet, uh, subscribing to our, uh, to our channel, and, and most importantly, uh, let, uh, let your friends know about it. You know, we're new to this whole thing, and we're committed to putting out quality content on this particular subject. Uh, it is your right to know, as, uh, as a member of the human species, uh, of, uh, of what is going on. It's not the government's place to filter this. Uh, so, uh, again, thank you for joining us. Chris, uh, go get some sleep, and uh, please thank your wife for let, letting you go over uh, on our interview. Uh, you're welcome here at uh, any time, and uh, we really appreciate your work. So, Chris, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, brother, and thank you, everyone else, for watching us. And, uh, yeah, just thank you so much. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And, again, uh, uh, tune in for our interview with Dr. Gary Nolan from Stanford uh, and uh, we will uh, see you guys in. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good one.